Hi everyone, welcome to the latest episode of VFX Futures. I'm Ian Fales from Befores and Afters. And today we've got a very special episode with The Third Floor about visualization. Joining me is Dane Smith, Vice President at The Third Floor. Hi Dane, how are you? I'm good, Ian. Thank you. How are you? Good, thank you. Thanks so much for joining me. And also Casey Schutz, who's the Head of Virtual Production at The Third Floor. Hi Casey. Hello, champion. How you doing? I'm good. Thank you both so much for coming on. One of the things that I love about talking about previs and visualization now is that it's just going through this major change, or at least from my point of view, it feels like it. You guys are in the thick of it. I wonder if both of you can sort of talk about that monumental change. And what I'm talking about here is a really big shift to real time but it also feels like a lot more is going on. What, what's what's the big changes that you've observed in the past couple of years? Maybe Dane, starting with you. I, I'm Thank you, because it's Casey and I may not get a word in edgewise, so I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. So I've noticed Mr. Tangent, so I'll just yap for hours. But, you know, I think both Dane and I will have uh, uh, valuable perspectives on this. But Dane, right. you, you, you go ahead. Casey, definitely from onset and artist experience, and I'm looking more at the client experience, which breaks down like this. Five or six years ago, this was an anomaly, creating content in the engine for a lot of reasons, um, most of them to do with a reluctance and unfamiliarity on the client's part of what we do. And then for those that were open to exploring this, uh, the entire system, the way that films are made, the way that they're financed, the amounts of uh, the amounts of resource allocation that go into each phase just didn't really favor the front loading that this requires mm. into previs into planning before you go on set which is not uh, i mean it's really strange if you stop back and stop and think about it because the most expensive part of the process is post and by planning carefully you've got a smaller team you're spending less money you're ensuring that that expensive process will be tailor-made to the film. You're not making creative decisions at the the most difficult um, and challenging part of the production financially. But that just isn't the way films are made. There's a huge legacy and you're fighting all of that when you're talking to the traditional filmmaking community. So it was an anomaly. There were a couple of shows that were doing it and COVID hit. And just before COVID, as the engine started to see wider adaptation and really we all have to thank the Mandalorian because while many of us were working in this technology and advocating for it and, and Casey's got a lot of great examples until you have something that everyone can point to as sort of this beacon that was created with this workflow that is successful um, you're really not going to move the needle very much and the Mandalorian kicked the door open everybody wanted to know who, who created this content, how did they do it, and they beat a path to our door. But again, there was some reluctance. It's it's not familiar territory for most people, and they could be a bit standoffish. It was also difficult to find people that were proficient. So we've come up with a number of solutions, uh, which we'll get into, but what's happened is that two to three shows out of a 30 show slate that we're using this, it's now completely reversed. Mm -hmm it's very unusual for a show not to be using some aspect of this technology. Um, the, the other knock that it got early on was the expense and the technical complication. And those have widely um, gone away in a large part because of Epic Unreal's uh, understanding of filmmaking and embracing with, you know, Kim Library's efforts and many others, embracing the filmmaker's needs and, and problem solving for the filmmaker but also the advance in technology. And, you know, again, if people wanted that look and that uh, experience of Mandalorian and LED, there are many options downstream from that. If we're taking physical and digital objects and combining them and doing in-camera effects, that is AR overlay on an iPad. I mean, that can be very simple. It can be something we can spin up in a couple of days that can be incredibly useful. So that's the shift we've seen. and. Uh, with COVID, it just accelerated because now filmmakers were forced to work in a way they hadn't before, and it, it really opened the door. So the success of Mandalorian, our continual advocacy 
which has always been uh, a passion of ours for many, many years. Um, and the fact that this pandemic forced people to look at content creation a different way, it's kind of been this perfect storm that has tipped things over to mm. where we are today, whereas most people are working with this method of content creation. Yeah, and, and Casey, you're, you, you, you know, typically go on set a lot. I mean, that's yes. one of your major roles. So from your yeah. perspective, and this course of head of virtual production, what have been those huge changes you've noticed? And basically been part of um, bringing in, frankly. Yeah, I mean, um, I think the, bit, the, the, the single biggest change, in my opinion, is handing the steering wheel to the client. You know, virtual mm. production, um, um, open, like democratizing computer graphics to folks that it's not realistic that um, Roger Deakins or Bob Richardson are these masters of cinematography. They're probably not going to sit down on Maya and learn keyframing and all, all, and, and all that. Um, but if you can hand them a virtual camera and you say, this is the, this is the Alexa film back. So the 35 millimeter focal length, the field of view, you're used to that. The depth of field, the circles of confusion. Uh, if we can sort of uh, get rid of that barrier between um, th these modern technologies and the way movies have been made for a hundred years, I see that as the change that I have personally mm -hmm. witnessed and hopefully been a small part of. Um, in the last, you know, 20 something years. So I graduated uh, CalArts 2002 and immediately jumped into what, you know, to Previs. And I didn't even know what Previs was at the time. And it was used on uh, the occasional high-end commercial, maybe a couple of movies here and there, but it was, um, uh, and Dane used the word reluctance. And sadly that there was a little bit of that reluctance there for, for Previs. There was a feeling like, well, are you trying to do the DP's job or the production designer's job? Are you taking our jobs from us? And it's like, no, they could be, it couldn't be further from the truth. I would prefer to have the production designer and the DP over my, my shoulder. And we're all stirring these ideas together. And I'm merely just visualizing what the people behind me who are way smarter than I am I'll, and will ever be at their respective disciplines. I just want to stir it together in a salad bowl and say, here's the sum total of what everyone's talking about. And that's, and that's visualization. And back at that time, it was just me going as fast as I could on, on Maya. So as people started talking, I would start to do, 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 and, and do things. And that was my, you know, quote, real time. I would just wanted to get as fast as I could with folks talking over my shoulder. Um, and, and now to be able to say, here's an iPad, why don't you why don't you hold it and show me what you're talking about? Because you always have that experience of like, okay, move it left. No, the other left. Come on, <laughs> you know. And and that's been um uh, and that was 2002, 2003, 2004. Um and there was there was this gap where where the, the you know the, the folks thought that we were trying to take something away, and it's like no 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 no. The idea here is to to fix it in pre. To, to you know um, um, let's any any problem that would really suck to find out on set when time and money is a really big deal let's find it out now ahead of time a week before the shoot if not longer and the only people on payroll are the three of us and the latte is that we purchased in the morning and that's it and let's <laughs> let's get this figured out and in some kind of ironic way it's using computers to not have to use computers later like let's 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 shoot stuff and get it as perfect as possible in camera so that it's not rescued with in post-production by computer graphics so so in this sort of bizarre way we're using technology to help maybe not have to use it later um yeah. and um and so that was that was you know when i when i started in previous 2003 2004 and and i think that that um that gap has has gotten lessened um and um uh you know it was in and hopefully um myself and everyone doing previs sort of got the message out there that like we want to um be the you know we want if, to if this is a yin yang we want to be at the center of it and just coalescing the ideas from from the director every every head of department grips construction and i think that that's for my job, I think that's the most fun and validating part is to get feedback from special effects, from the art department, um, from stunts about safety. And, right. and, and, and 
I'm not the, the cle- and, and I, to this day, I don't consider myself to be that witty, clever guy on a laptop that's that got all the answers. It's, it's the exact opposite. All of you have the answers, but they're all in, in your minds individually. So what I want to do is, is everyone gets their feedback and I merely in Maya or Unreal or whatever it is, Motion Builder, you know, here is the sum total of everyone's input. And if we agree, awesome, let's go make a movie. Now we have a, we can go on the set and have a battle plan and get the director's vision um, fulfilled and not say, wait, wait, you have, you have a, you have a crane over there, but I have my lighting, you know, let's all just sort of compile this information together. And so more and more over the years now, this build this kind of democratizing of computer graphics to um, and another example would be motion capture. Like, you know, yeah. imagine a, 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 a trained theater actor who is just amazing at emoting with their body and, and movements and, and uh, physiology and all this amazing stuff. It's not realistic that they'll sit down on Maya and learn keyframing, but, but, you know, so, so they were being like, they were kind of missing out on computer graphics and digital technology, but Hey, look, we're going to put this suit on you with some funny markers. And now look at this, you're alive, you're a monster or you're a, a futuristic warrior or whatever it is. And so we've opened computer graphics up to, to, mm-hmm. to, to everyone, to other artists that weren't going to sit down like me and just learn Maya for a decade. Like that's not realistic for everybody and it, sh- and it shouldn't be. So, so these people, for these wonderful artists in these different mediums can now join the computer graphics fold. And I see, I see that as virtual production, pre and tech viz all sort of shaking hands. Um, sorry, that was a long answer. I could, yeah, but you know. <laughs> oh, that, that was good. I, I think one of the interesting points that um, it raised for me is how quickly those um, those departments that have previously not had access to these tools embrace it, especially yeah. art department. They absolutely love it. Production designers and art department sitting with someone that is helping craft what the director will ultimately take on to set, making those yeah. decisions early on about what's going to be digital, where are we lighting things, pro- being able to provide answers for the director that are entirely uh, fleshed out instead of, well, I've got my niche and I think this will work, but I don't know what those computer people are doing. Um, yeah. To bring together and present a solution really unlocks the capacity and promise of computer graphics in a way that we haven't really seen before. And the producers are happy. It's a massive cost savings. It ensures a lot of duplication of effort is gone and it unlocks creativity. I mean, at the end of the day, that's what we're trying to do, right? The tools should take a backseat to people's creativity and their craft. And we're there to serve that. So the more that we can enter the realm early of production design, uh, lighting, uh, art department, the better that we can service the director's vision and the more likely we are to iterate an idea that is uh, you know, something that hadn't previously been considered mm. and change the, for the better the, the finished film. Absolutely. I, I mean, one of the interesting things, and Casey and Dan, you both sort of mentioned it, is previs was a thing. You know, I've I've covered it for so long, and basically, I just always imagined it was done in Maya as a play blast thing. Um, yeah. I sort of wanted to jump straight into one of the newer solutions, actually, that Third Floor seems to have come up with, which is that transition from Maya to um, more real-time rendering, but still using Maya. I understand yeah. you basically, and, and we're going to talk about virtual scouting and VCAMs. You know, sometimes that's more of like the sexy side of visualization now. But I'm really curious about what the old previs, previs was and what you're now using. You, you have a solution called Mercury, right? Yeah, so Mercury is the pipeline to let... Um, said Maya artist who might not be for, familiar with Unreal basically work in the tool set that they're comfortable with. Mm. But then, oh, by the way, on the other monitor, you're, they're seeing the results in mm. Unreal because you're not the visual fidelity, the lighting, the bounce lighting, that is not going to be matched in Maya or Motion Builder uh, anytime soon, if, if ever. I mean, Unreal has really, really um, pushed that and, it, and it's quite amazing. But kind of what I was saying before about the the workflow, having come from 
being a video game software and movie making is, is, is radically different. And so, um, as I mentioned, I was at first one of the holdouts, like, yes, it looks fantastic, but the workflow to make iterative changes and now we're on version 52 and wait a minute, we got to go, you know, it's, it wasn't there, uh, yet. So I was still opting to have the visual fidelity be more or less, you know, nineties open GL, you know, kind of looking, but, uh, but but at, but be able to be really accurate, especially with uh, you know with all the onset technical demands. And I think now what what the Mercury pipeline is doing has kind of erased those concerns that I could be in Maya and do all the things that I'm comfortable with there, but I get the visual fidelity of of Unreal because um, once the game engine thing, you know, uh, as Dane alluded to, it really was this kind of drug where people would almost come in and say, "Are you using the game engine?" And it's like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but by the way, let's talk about your movie. But but, but it's a game engine. Like it became such a hot yeah. term, um, you know. And and I'm still in the corner, kind of like, yes, it looks cool. But the more important thing is for you to have right. 50 billion different ideas and do it quickly. Mm -hmm. And at the at the time, like you know, six or seven years ago, it, we still weren't there where you could iterate it as quick. And now that's been dissolved. And so, um, and uh, you know, as, as Dane kind of alluded to, as far as you know, uh, casting and artist availability, like the pool of Maya Motion Builder users right. is still larger than you know X person that is an ace at Unreal. Um, and those people are are getting hired left and right. And it's an amazing uh, amazing skill set and one that I need to to catch up on because I'm I've been kind of in the in this orbit over here with Gazebo, um, but. Um, um, you know the so going back to the to the Mercury tool set, hopefully, kind of like what we talked about with the bridge between previs and traditional production being you know thinned out. Um, hopefully, that's becoming the same thing where the Maya artists are just working with the tools that they're comfortable with, and we have 20 years of software that we've been writing um, that's very very specific to pre-production um, at third floor because we have no interest in finaling. We will never compete with. What an ILM and frame store. It's such incredible work that they do. Mm. We have no interest in competing or even trying to. The only, like, all we care about is everything that happens before and during production um, right. to make the footage that we shoot as perfect as possible. So that those, that, so that then, you know, when you, when, if you're going to, if you're going to send a piece of footage to a Weta, an ILM or whatever, wouldn't you want it to be the most perfectly photographed thing? All the perspective matches up. So when they put the, so that the, the magic that they do putting in an alien or a big monster or whatever it is, they're focused on that, not and, and the, the, the money and the time of those amazing post houses is going to that, not to you know, recreating a poorly shot plate. Like they have right. the skill to do that and photogrammetry and projection techniques. They could rescue a poorly shot plate. But is that the, is that the right, is that the best use of the, of the talent that uh, exists at ILM and Weta and Framestore and DMEG and these companies? No. no. So all third floor is interested in is the pre-production and, and the onset aspects of, of the photography. So that when when that footage gets gets sent, it's as it's you know we we did all the homework we possibly could to make sure that 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 footage is as perfect as it gets before it gets there. Yeah, yeah. The cardinal sin for us to commit is show a creative something that cannot manifest, that can't be done in the real world. Yeah. We will never do that. We we are very very carefully planning what's actually going to be executed. A couple of points, though, that Casey touched on that I want to talk about. Everything that we create is ultimately a proxy. And the closer we can get to final quickly and in an iterative fashion without utilizing a lot of resources, the better value we are to our clients. So what that's now extended into, you know, I talked about starting with the art department. We're, we're on the entire show because Casey um, provides incredible value in tech viz basically measuring, you know, creating a set plan, making sure this is all going to work. And there are so many examples, but I always think of Beauty and the Beast, which is like this perfect orchestration of physical and digital puppetry happening in real time, being directed by someone who is largely concer concerned with the choreography and the music. Yeah. You know, a Broadway director mm. who was, un you know, unintimidated and not hindered by the digital tool set. And it's, it's a work of art. And if you look at the behind the scenes on our website, you really see how much 
uh, ingenuity went into creating that and how much we are staying out of the way of the creative process. But the other thing that it's unleashed is post phase because the elements that we create are so beautifully lit and, and th that all happens so quickly with Unreal that we can get very close to final so that clients can stand up a test screening of friends and family. Mm. They can start trimming down the asks of the very expensive post process and, and start to build and craft their film and put it up on the screen and not have it be something that you have to suspend disbelief to imagine what the finals will look, will look like. We get very close, but it is all replaced. And then the other point that uh, Casey touched on is disruption. Anytime a new technology comes along, it can display the large part of the workforce and no one has suffered more in the last 20 years with displacement and uncertainty you know all of the outsourcing that happened and prior to that the writers strike and and this technology um, than the visual effects community but with our mercury tool set oh and I, I do need to call out eric carney our cto it was his brainchild of his late nights he without eric this would not exist and um it was, a, it was a really challenging rollout, but it's working perfectly. And it allows us to take the Maya community who have spent 15 or 20 years investing their time and energy in becoming a craftsman and an expert at that technology and sit at a box with the interface they're used to and produce results seamlessly in Unreal Engine. So that's the other thing that, you know, was born out of necessity. There simply weren't the volumes of people that we needed to produce the work. But the end result is we're not displacing anyone, you know, mm. and we're leveraging all of that talent. And as we're starting with the front end of the development cycle and engaging with people that aren't used to using uh, computer tool sets, I, I always think of a, a film we did with Paramount that is not a big digital film. It's not a big visual effects film and it wasn't a big budget film, but they were doing set scouting in New York and Addison Bath, who was working with us at the time, just took um, Unreal and took a couple of the animation cycles, put them into the iPad. We shipped the iPad by FedEx to the uh, location scout and they were able to hold it up and look at the room and decide whether this animated creature who changed in scale based on interaction with humans would fit in the location and lock it. And this, you know, it was a few hundred dollars and a few hours work. That's virtual production. That is mm. digital and physical being combined. And that director who was very, uh, almost a technophobe initially, just embraced it once he saw the power of it. You know, the bar to entry is getting lower and lower because of the visual fidelity and because of the uh, ability that we have to untap the skill set that already exists and apply it to engine. It, it, it's really interesting, Dane, you mentioned what is virtual production now? Because so many things are, which I right. really like. And, you know, Casey you've, and Dane, you've also mentioned third floor is on the film the whole time often because there's so many different um, aspects to it. One thing I wanted to talk about was virtual scouting. I think it's a really interesting, powerful planning tool. Casey, what, what are the different ways that you get involved perhaps in virtual scouting and what are the different solutions and tools that third floor has there? Well, uh, you know, every every set that's been made on Avatar has been made digitally first, and then Jim scouts it in the in the virtual camera, mm -hmm. and we can start to make notes on, um, you know, if if I'm if if the actor's entering from over there and then exiting from there, and then the digital Navi is there, well, maybe we need to move that thing out of the way. I'm, I'm trying my hardest to not get into, um, to not cite any specific examples, but, um, you know, basically the, going back to the idea of anything you can find out ahead of time before time, money, and energy really and truly build a set, then let's, let's do that. And a lot of times what you learn, and this is an especially uh, an important relationship with the art department, is what you don't need to build. Because if Jim says all my action is here, um, you can actually look at the camera frustrum and um, uh, like kind of like animate over time and see like he never pan panned past this on the frame left or this on frame right. So you get this sort of triangle that's like we we almost only need to build that, mm. and hopefully that kicks back to 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 budget. Like okay, that thing behind me, um, we don't need to build half of that. You know, because as we were really looking at the action, and even if it's really pre 
cursor animation. Sometimes it's just yeah. chess pieces, just yeah. blocks. Mm -hmm. You know, it just looks like dolls moving through. But if they scribe the positions in space that they're doing, you can then be in the virtual version of the set and have a very, very, very good idea of what you need to build and, and, and what you don't. And then um, some of the other scouting examples would be just going on to, and, and, and kudos to the AR toolkit in the, in the iPad, because, mm -hmm. um, you know, another, you mentioned Ian about virtual production, the very definition and the term being kind of amorphous in it. And it is because I, I don't see virtual production as this specialized discipline where you go to a room with, with when you wear lots of markers and there's like that still happens there are very much what motion capture volumes and, and all of that that still happens but it's not as segmented as it was before where it was this special thing where you went to a special gray room and you so the idea that in your hotel room or, or on the streets because of the ar toolkit you can actually be correctly tracking and mapped out without the presence of an optical volume wow that's really rad and that kind of goes back to what I said earlier about the democratization of, you know, democratizing of these computer graphics tools to folks that weren't, that aren't going to sit down and learn Unreal right. and Maya and all yeah. that. So I think Dane's example of like shipping that iPad and saying like, you know, that big monster, if it steps, if it's here on Fifth Avenue and it goes drunk and crushes a cab, if we tilt up, there's a traffic light right there. Oh no, you know, what, whatever the case may be, the idea is, you know, let's do our homework and find out ahead of time. And maybe actually if we can get, you know, um, permissions to shoot on that part of the block, just down right. there, wouldn't, right. that, wouldn't that be great to find that out ahead of time, then being on set with the, with yeah. the cast and the crew and director and find that something, some kind of physical limitation um, um, and, and something else that's, that's become much more ubiquitous is, is LIDAR. So we have the Leica BLK. Um, so this, this idea that we can go and do a laser accurate scan of a location, then bring that LIDAR back, do previs there and find like, oh man, there's this huge, you know, said object that we cannot move mm -hmm. out of the way. You know, it's not a set where we can just like, it's wild, it's, it's a wall that can wild. And so that's something that, like, like, um, um, you know, I mean, the last ten years has just been so amazing because um, I now I don't do any on-set tech viz or anything without having lidar or do, doing photogrammetry of the equipment. So I have the Super Techno 50 every bolt, you know, um, the the you know Chapman dollies, the Steadicam rig, the Steadicam person that's holding the rig. I even I even did a body scan of him because we're doing a, in, in the upcoming sequels. We have a lot of stuff in close quarters where we need to see like and we're shooting in stereo so the the rig is much is much bigger than a, a traditional um mono camera and so the, the like these the, like the 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 gap between reality and digital it just keeps shrinking and shrinking and shrinking mm. and so um i lidar or photogrammetry everything obsessively um mm. because going back to kind of what what dane said the cardinal sin of, of pre-visualization and something that we've always always been really really religious about is to show someone pixels on a screen dancing around and then they get the set and they can't and it can't have it previously been a division um between computer graphics and reality and hopefully over the years there's been more of a respect and appreciation for for being on set while we're inside the computer where gravity and physics don't matter and you can run through walls like well, well, well no we need to use accurate equipment which by the way you usually you tend to do better previs when you respect the physics of camera work anyway right. because if you do something a million miles an hour in five frames that's like the audience's mm -hmm. brain is like no that's something's off there you know um so if you if you sort of um respect and harness the live action parameters when you're inside the computer where anything goes, I think that your computer graphics work looks better for it. Right. You're tr you you have some physics built into it. There are, yes. you know, laws of physics that are informing your decision. The other intangible um, that I've seen many times is a director or crew that have spent their time pre-visualizing and planning in pre-production what will happen. And a lot of what Casey described LiDAR scans, a real world digital playset, are so confident and comfortable when they step on set. We've all been on set when it dawns on us that we could have done something better or a large volume of work I've asked someone to do is now being thrown away because I was missing a piece of information. 
And if we start with a small band of people at the beginning and gradually add in a very organic way um, the various, you know, components of the team that are going to be on set, there's a confidence that happens. There. There's a confidence that uh, the director has that we have his back or her back. We've, we've got a really clear image that we're working towards. If we read a, a document, if we read a script, everyone's got a different mental image. The more we can get something up on a screen and discuss it and look at it and light it and yeah. decide what the best angle is, and the more people that can participate in that process, you know, you're paying good money for someone to light or design or build something physical. You really want to get all of their experience. You don't want to have them standing on the side of the set later saying, gee, if I knew you were going to do that, I could have done X. You really want to, you know, uncover that, explore it and and use that to leverage the next decision. And that's really what the uh, digital tool set allows you to do. Yeah. And 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 I guess just on that digital tool set, um, I imagine you guys third floor just works, depends on the project, depends on the filmmaker. You just adapt to whatever um oh, yeah. is being used as you mentioned casey like when you're yeah. currently working with wetter and um on and the sequ avatar sequels and whatever you know you yeah. adapt but but third floor does have its own tool set i mentioned something about virtual scouting um is that tool that you tend to offer to clients something called pathfinder is that the one pathfinder cyclops mercury these are these are some of the uh tools that we offer and uh, were developed again by Eric and that we're constantly, well, this is something that was a conscious decision by the founders when they started the company to take the profit and reinvest in technology. And again, we're not a tech company. We're not building apps or, mm. you know, chasing that uh, horizon. We're solving problems for filmmakers and, and we're well aware of what those problems are because we're constantly on set and witnessing it firsthand and feeding that information back to our team and coming up with solutions. So the tools that you mentioned um, are widely being used and I can't think of a single case. It's, there's that term force multiply. Anytime that someone is able to use Cyclops or Pathfinder, they mm -hmm. will advocate for it on the next show. There isn't a huge marketing push behind it. It just organically fits in and as that team disbands the cinematographer gaffer um, art department producer director they, they'll advocate for that tool or something similar because once you use it and the problems are solved you really aren't going back to the old way of doing things yeah the, particularly best, the, the best sales pitch is just to say oh by the way hold this and point over there and see if that's kind of what you were thinking and, and, and just let 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 them say oh mm. this is this is really cool and they might say hey nifty but i feel more comfortable just standing here and pointing at this screen. And that's perfectly fine. We we, we, right. we, do, we do not say, gosh darn it, this is your future. Um, but I, you know, but it makes the sales pitch easy if it's truly helping them get their vision across and you just say, oh, by the way, this iPad thing. No, you don't need to be in an optical volume. You could be standing right here and do it. Yeah, put on a 50 mil lens. Oh yeah, the, 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 the focus is shallow now. So you're just isolating the character. Right. And notice that you're just looking in that same part of the, of the room. You know, if we just, you really just don't have to do the used car salesman thing. And hopefully it just in and of itself, they say, this is okay. Got it. And there, and like Dane said, there are a lot of repeat customers. And so I think um, we've, we've toned down the, the, the sales pitching thing and have just said, here's a, here's a sushi platter, pick the ones that are working for you. We might want to show you this one for two minutes. Okay. You're not feeling it. No problem. Let's get back to work with the workflow that you are comfortable with. Mm. Most executives are not uh, particularly interested in something that's going to increase costs or slow down the pace of production. They just want to have happy creatives realize their vision. So when you think about Cyclops, it's a tool to move around, rotate and scale a CG assets, save them as bookmarks. You're doing the job of a previous artist or a supervisor yourself in a very tactile way. You're pointing the camera at the objects. You're, you're lighting, you're changing lenses, you're saving recordings. There's a feature called side loading that allows you to import assets. So now the entire asset library is at your fingertips and we can load it in and you can look at it on the lens that you want, on the set that you want, 
um, and get a really good sense of what you're getting yourself into, whether that's CG characters, creatures, sets, set extensions. It's all just a handheld device. And the great thing about the advances in tablet technology is we all use them. You know, I have a four year old son and he picks up a book and starts pinching and squeezing. He just expects everything to respond that way. So regardless of the um, entry point that you're meeting someone at, you know, some of the directors that have been at this for a while that are really can be intimidated by technology. You hand them an iPad with a game vice on it and it's just intuitive. You point it toward the towards the object, you're toggling through the lens kit, and you're up and running. I think where I'm most excited to use Cyclops is walking into an empty sound stage. Mm-hmm. Yes. I've I've had so many discussions with with uh, Grip, art director, uh, production designer, where we're just on we're on F stage and it's empty. And you know, we do yes, we've got the the architectural plan view, but to be able to 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 use to to use the the, the iPad and get aligned so that it knows where we are on that stage and then say, okay, if we, if, all right, if construction is there and then, oh man, that thing's going to get really close to the wall. It might be so close to the wall that the camera won't fit. Uh-oh, anything. And, and but there's something about, in which we're doing now in the, in the virtual camera, but we're not, we're not doing it like on the actual set there, because there is something about being at the location that will yeah. never be, never be substituted or recreated by, a VR or a virtual camera, like you're that yeah. wall, that wall is real. You're right there, exactly. you put your back up yeah. to it. And you see like, dude, that thing is going to be really, really huge. Do we, is, is it, you know, can we even light from the catwalk anymore? Is that going to be too short of a, of a throw on the light? You know, all that stuff. And, and, uh, and the point being is that I can hand it to the grip. I can hand it to production design um, costumes. Who cares? Just anybody, it, it, it you know, I, I, we're coming back to this kind of theme of, um, of the democratizing of all these tools so that right. everyone can get, get in on it and, and have their say, have their ideas, voice their concerns, and then people like us merely stir it all together and present that visual product and say, here is the net result of, of what everyone thinks. Do we all agree? Yep. Okay. Hooray. Now I'll, you know, print out some other things and we're, we've, we've got a battle plan for, for how to shoot this really efficiently. And if you think about the origin of film, right, and you think about the we're, we're also coming back full circle when we're doing in-camera effects to a time when there wasn't digital technology. You look through the viewfinder and you're lighting, using force perspective and whatever bag of tricks you can to allow the audience to suspend disbelief and believe they're under the ocean or on a trip to the moon. And that's exactly what we've come back to now. You're looking through the viewfinder at in-camera VFX. You, you're no longer looking at 90% of the real estate being green screen and hoping for the best and yeah. you know trying to make creative decisions in post after everyone's left set and all of your band of artisans that you've paid uh, uh, and, and listened to and helped craft this image are gone and you're alone in an edit bay um, handing shots off. That, yeah. that, those days are gone. Oh yeah. It, it raises an interesting point, though, and it's something you mentioned before, Casey, about the perception of visualization or previous artists. And I, I wanted to ask you that in relation to, say, virtual camera. One of the virtual camera tools I think you use is Glassbox's Dragonfly. Yeah. But but you you obviously, you're right, people can pick up an iPad, an iPhone, there's other vCams around. But do previous artists, visualization artists need to have a cinematography eye, cinematography training to understand filmic language and film shots. Because as you say, you are crafting shots that are intended for the final film. I'm just curious about the crossover there. Uh, I, I, I would, you know, again, you always see, uh, you always see problem solving through your own lens. And so I really, I, I come from traditional cinematography and, uh, uh, and so I would say, yes, you know, um, that, that, that the, you know, that said previous animator working at their floor or, or wherever should have at least the basic chops of shot blocking the rule of thirds mm. focus, you know, um, um, screen direction and all that. Of course, there are sometimes, um, subdivisions within the crew so one person might never want to look through a camera like camera like what is a focal length ah, but they could animate a character 50 times better than i ever could right. so sometimes you mm-hmm. do have the subdivisions within the talent base and i think this is you know 
third floor in every every company is going to have something like that. Like here's this particular individual can animate a walk cycle like you would never believe. But when you say the word film back or focal length, their the eyes just get crossed and it's just like not their thing. But they might publish that animation. But that being said, if they're doing something that a human would have to do, yeah, they'd have to respect the laws of physics so that we don't make a character jump or run, you know, five times faster than what is possible in reality. So that when you're on the real set, the actor's like, yeah, congratulations on that quick time, but that is completely impossible, mm. you know? Um, and now we do a lot of work with Marvel and all sorts of things that do bend reality and do all these crazy trippy things, which is wonderful. Just, just flag it ahead of time. That's all. And I think that's the key difference. Of course, use computer graphics for the fact that it, that gravity and going through walls and transparent, you know, who cares? Go for it. That's all great, but it's flagged ahead of time as this is this typically is a visual effects shot, and we're going to do some clever techniques to make Doctor Strange look like he's floating and all that kind of stuff. But I think that what we the baseline that we come back to is to pretend that we really and truly are on a live action set and animate that way, mm. and, and then and, and, you know and 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 not get too seduced by the seduction of of. of of these parameters of live action filmmaking not existing in the in the computer. So again, sorry for the tangent, but but yes, I, I do I, I do think that um, even if your your heart is in character animation and that's your main thing, it can never hurt to to uh, watch um, the Visions of Light documentary, which is something that changed my life. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that that really did it for me um, to to see. The, the art of, 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 the, of, the, of the cinematographer and lighting and, and that, 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 that back and forth with the, with the director and um, just crafting these images and the, the shot of um, like, how can, how, can, how can you not look at the shot um, in, um, in Cold Blood when the rain is coming down the, the, the window in, it, in the shadow and it looks like it's crying, you mm -hmm. know, and it looks like the actor's crying. I mean, and that's something that, oh, sorry, here we go on a tangent again, but um, that's something that you you often don't get in computer graphics, which is which are those happy accidents. Because when Conrad Hall is telling that story, he yeah. they were I think it was actually raining or it was special effects rain. I forgot about that, but he said he said to the director, "You you got to see this," and it's this really emotional part for the actor. And the rain, the the the, the shadow of the rain looks like tears. And that that idea of happy accidents is yeah. something that is the lifeblood of regular movie making. Exactly, and you tend to not get that in the vacuum of mathematical perfection that is computer graphics. But with virtual production, you kind of can because yeah. you can you can screw up and take a step the wrong way and see something that you weren't planning on. You don't get that as often with keyframing and this and all the trigonometric yeah. perfection you get out of the computer. You don't get those happy accidents that that are that are a daily occurrence on set and. So with virtual production, whether it's mocap or virtual camera or whatever, it's it's opening that part of something that I think most of, of Hollywood and in and, and all of the, in international filmmaking, most of the most amazing moments that we all grow up remembering probably were happy accidents of that. Right. Sort. You know, Star like the, the shooting star in um, Indiana Jones, like that. Oh my gosh, that just happened. That, that really happened in the sky when they were rolling. How amazing is that? That's so cool. You, you know, let's yeah. try to get more, let's try to get messy and get more of that in, in computer graphics, you know, more gritty, more alive, more reality. It's counterintuitive because as soon as you talk about computer graphics, people think of confinement, restrictions. I'm going to be talking to this engineer who's primarily going to tell me what I can't do. I'm an artist. I, I don't want to be restricted, but I see it happen. I just saw it happen yesterday with a client. It's a studio picture and a director's first time really embracing this technology. But our supervisors are photographers. They're filmmakers. They're tactile filmmakers. The, the real power of this uh, technology is exactly what Casey was describing. It's allowing the director to capture those serendipitous moments that you couldn't possibly plan in advance letting people play and find the shot and again it's counterintuitive because as soon as you hear computer graphics and virtual production you start to think or many directors start to think restriction 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 the whole idea of previs um can sometimes get a bad knock because directors think well we're planning everything in advance it doesn't allow uh, for any artistry 
But the opposite is true. Once you actually dive into it, it allows for all the artistry in the world. You're iterating. You, you can explore in every way and you're listening to the chorus of voices that you've asked to join you and having them uh, work at their very best because they're seeing the final image and, and they're getting inside the director's head. So it, it becomes a very collaborative experience. And I think that um, that's one of the hurdles that we really um, fight. But within 10 minutes of a call, once they're talking to a supervisor who understands photography, a filmmaker will embrace that and recognize that kindred spirit. And then we're off to the races. Yeah. I wanted to ask you also both about something in terms of the whole pipeline. About 10 years ago, I remember one of the things that was talked about a lot with previews was, hey, we're building these characters as Maya previews models. We're building these sets. We're doing camera moves. But it wasn't a simple, simple matter then of pushing that through all the way to, say, giving that data to the visual effects studio. I felt like picked companies were and the VFX studio was using it as much as possible. I wondered whether in this new paradigm of virtual production and real time and unreal and, and whatever else is being used. Do you feel like that's actually coming to the fore? Is that a much clearer pathway from early planning and actual shot design through to the VFX studio, including the provision of assets, Casey? I, 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 I think it is. And um, and the more that, and uh, the, the first time that I really experienced this was, I think um, the first Avatar and, and Real Steel, where the production mm -hmm. designer was actually there with us. And, and this is important. So were the folks from Weta and or in the case of Real Steel Digital Domain. And they were part of that initial asset creation. So, and that's, that's important, um, is, is that, that, that model went from, um, you know, the, it was on the mocap stage in a very low resolution form, uh, and then got iterated on and iterated on, uh, and then ended up in the final model, uh, in, in, in the film. And yeah. a lot, you know, a lot of what we're doing on the, on the sequels right now is, is, um, very much, you know, bad and Weta are very much, um, uh, you know, joining forces in the way that, um, assets are published and everything. So there will be little to no wasted modeling and you're not wrong ian about you know there there has been quite a lot of where we will build all kinds of things and you would think that it would just kind of like okay file save as to the vendor and they would use it and that mm. has worked quite a bit but a lot of times i think for you know maybe um in parallel they've been making their own higher resolution model or and sometimes you receive a model from someone else and you look at it and you just get the you you get the basic um, um, hit points and bounding box dimensions, but you kind of want to model it yourself. Sometimes it's easier, and I'm guilty of this sometimes with compositing. Like I'll inherit uh, a comp from another artist who did a perfectly fine job, but I'm I don't know where your head was at and how you layered and matted everything. I'm kind of just going to do this. So I think there's, if we were to just be brutally honest, I think there has been some of that. Well, they'll they'll take the previous model and say cool, got it. Here's the part I really need to focus on. Mm. I'm now going to go control mm. N for new file and I'm going to do it. Uh, but I think that with the way that you need to publish assets for, for Unreal and for, you know, Gazebo, what we're using here lends itself to that utopian idea that you model once and you just continue to iterate. And that not only that model, but where it is in world space stays true from the first virtual camera session Actually, before virtual camera, usually we would do mocap with the actors, um, and and so we'll do what we call the the Zulu, which is the basic um, um, you know blocks and ramps and and things that adhere to the topography of the forest, even though they're just you know blue boxes and gray platforms and whatnot, but they geometrically adhere really well. That world space stays from that day through for the next three or four years until the final image is rendered. So where where that object is, its basic overall size um, and and it, you know in its Cartesian like where it is in world space, that we we pretty much don't change any of that. And when I'm doing the the tech biz, I'll take the lidar of the stage and I'll slave it to it. So even at the tech biz level, I'm still kind of respecting you know that the fact that it's in positive x a thousand units away like we try to keep that simple because things can get really confusing in between artists and in between vendors and in between departments if it's like 
oh, I brought it back to the origin and I flopped it on negative X and like that, no, no, do not, don't, don't go there. So um, I think that what you said is becoming more and more true day by day with, with the, because part of, part of why Unreal is, ama is as amazing as it is, is that, uh, and is that you have to, you do have to be kind of diligent about your asset prep. So, so level of detail, mit maps, mm. you know, and that's why every, every CPU cycle uh, that can be economized, it is. And so that lends itself very well to the traversal of the assets from us pre folk and, and all up into final. So the dream workflow, and I think what you, what we're seeing on Mandalorian and a lot of what we're doing um, here on Avatar is that the, the final vendors and the VAD slash previous folks yeah. are all working together. Yeah. Not third floor created this wacky model and it has no bearing yeah. what we're finally doing. Like we would rather get input from them and say, you know what, you know, bake out an OBJ model, let's bring it, let's bring it back. We'll kind of adhere to it or the best we can so that it's not a conversion process. That's that would suck if it was like, hooray, we did previs and we did some clever right. post viz. Now we're gonna convert it. So that's silly. Let's let's all get on the same page on day one so that the all the assets and the cameras just sort of slide through the pipeline. So has it always been like that? Uh, probably, probably not. Um, but I definitely think the trend is going in the utopian direction now of making the asset one time and it just lives through the pipeline from the first day of previs or motion capture or whatever it is to the image on the screen. You know, you go into post-production, that's when you engage the AAA visual effects houses and start to fill in the green screen and, and find your film. We're actually seeing a lot of camaraderie and, and I'll give you a couple of examples. When you talk about building an asset that will survive through and right into the library, the final spender, that's basically what's happening on the stage of the Mandalorian. And it's various companies, you know, Happy Mushroom, Felix's company and Third Floor work very closely together. And then we organically started to problem solve with Lux Machina and Phil's company. And we started this sort of Sunday phone call um, chain to compare notes because we were getting asked questions by various studios. And if you speak to the VAD department or you speak to Third Floor or you speak to on-set operations, you may get a slightly different answer and it can get very confusing. And this is something um, that I borrow from Casey all the time. It's that single point of contact. And there are a lot of moving parts to this new method of content creation. So we've been forced to band together and there's a lot of camaraderie. And we actually um, spent a great deal of the year, uh, this year and last year, educating executives and filmmakers with no sort of business initiative. It wasn't a business development exercise. It was genuinely getting on a call, writing up a document that showed the workflow and then explaining in sequence what each of us do. And the people that followed that blueprint did exactly what you're describing. And that is what happens on the set of The Mandalorian. Those mm -hmm. assets that Felix is building, we're using for previs, but they're continuing on to finals. That is the uh, impetus when they first uh, touch the mouse, when they first start to map out the geo. It's we're building an asset for final. Previs is going to borrow it at some stage and find the shots, but we're continuing a path that we'll see final. So we're all, you know, stepping into the same well uh, to take our assets from it, and it forces camaraderie, which is is something that um, I think everyone benefits from. Absolutely. Guys, I, I might have to wrap it up there for no other reason than there's an anti-lockdown protest oh, no. in the oh, park no. opposite our unit. I'm sorry. Maybe you can't I'm hear sorry. all the helicopters, but there's like 30 cops outside and oh a whole God. bunch of um, helicopters around. So I might just go and check that out. But I feel like we've really dived in a fantastic way into the third floor's um, approach to visualization and previews and I've really enjoyed chatting to you both about that so thank you so much it's yeah really I would great. love to Ian I would love to you know unless you get arrested um you know um uh, <laughs> uh you know Dana and I promise to bail you out um yeah absolutely you know we haven't even really gotten, we haven't gotten into simulcam and LEDs mm. you know there's there's a lot you know maybe one That's hour true. just wasn't realistic to begin with for this so I, I would be thrilled to have a, a part two if you are. 
Yeah, that's a great idea. And and you're right, the, 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 the second new wave of things is what's happening with LED volumes, of course, yes. and that's a Mandalorian thing, but happening in so many other productions right now. Um, yeah. I'd love to talk about it. Because uh, for a lot of people, LEDs are their first simulcam. You know, the first time right. that they're, instead of a green screen, they're seeing, you know, sim- we're, we're, you know, we're simulcamming everything on the Avatar sequels, and it's been a widely used tool. But, um, but you know, there's a lot of people that still have not seen simulcam, but there's, mm-hmm. but so for a lot of, mm-hmm. for a lot of folks, LEDs are the first time that they're looking through, and instead of seeing green, they're seeing the planet or whatever it is. And so yeah. uh, it's, a, it's a pretty incredible um, um, tool set that, I'm, that that we're seeing um, evolving right now. So, um, but yeah, go check out, you know, make sure you don't, <laughs> Uh, um, you know, make sure you don't get arrested. Yeah. Take care of yourself. Yeah. Um, and I wish you the best. I, I, you know, we read the news on what's going on in Australia and just hope the best for you guys. I mean, I know it, it's, it's, it's been rough. Um, and, you know, here in New Zealand, it's, a, you know, we're smaller and they, they shut down immediately when there was one mm. case. And it seems like um, it's uh, the, in Australia, you're having a tougher time. So we wish you the best in health and happiness and, not going too stir crazy in your apartment. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Casey. And thank you, Dane. Real pleasure to talk to both of you. Thank you so much. My, my, my pleasure. Let's, let's Ian, get... thank you for documenting everything yeah. that's happening. I think there's a revolution going on right now, and I wish I had time to do what you're doing. I think it's really critical it is. That you're talking to the people that are doing this work and documenting it, because at some point this will just become the status quo. And it's important that we're able to look back and look at this period of transition and see how it all came about. Mm. And it's Unreal Engine. It's all the practitioners. It's people like Casey and Eric innovating. But thank you for documenting it, Ian. And let, thank, thank you very much. And let's schedule a part two. Yes. I think it's a great idea. Awesome. Thanks, guys. And thanks, everyone, for listening. Really appreciate it. Of course. Cheers. Thanks, Ian. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye awesome. now. Bye.